Hey, welcome back to Complexity Papers. And also, welcome to my new lecture series on networks and complexity. Finally, welcome to the Czech Republic. Because in this course, we are going to make things real. My promise to you is that in almost every lecture, we are going to study a real-world problem and then solve it with pen and paper. Our first adventure takes us here, to Brno, the capital of the Czech province of Moravia. We must travel back to the year 1925, when Brno was part of Czechoslovakia. The country had just been newly formed at the end of the First World War. And it must have been a really exciting place, right? Imagine a newly born country, highly industrialized, right in the center of Europe, in a time when technologies like cars and airplanes and electricity became available to the ordinary people for the first time. This brings us right to our problem. In 1925, Jindrus Saxel was an employee of West Moravian power plants, and he was in charge of building a power grid to connect 50 towns. The requirements for such a network are pretty clear, aren't they? You want to build it such that power can flow from every place in the network to every other place. But at the same time, you want to minimize the cost of the power lines. So how do you design such a power grid? Today it's hard to reconstruct which towns exactly were on Saxon's list. So I will just use Moravia's five biggest cities as an example. These are Brno, Ostrava, Hilova, Olomouc and Selin. These five cities are going to be the nodes of the network we are going to build. In mass, such network nodes are called vertices. And together, the five nodes form a set, a list of things. In this case, the vertex set V. We can write it with curly brackets, like this. The links in our network are going to be the power lines. And we can describe them now by the pair of nodes that they connect. For instance, this line here, L1, is going to connect Brno to Ostrava. In mass, such links are called edges, and together, all the links in the network form the edge set E. Now, if you have a vertex set V and an edge set E, it describes the whole network. And that is what we call a graph in mathematics. I know what you're wondering about right now. Why has there got to be a different mathematical term for everything? That's just one of the things we have to put up with in interdisciplinary research. Different disciplines use language differently. In this case, math got there first. And later, when physics and computer science got interested in networks, they coined their own terms. So nowadays, in network science, most things actually have two names. When I started to work in networks, the mathematical terminology bothered me a lot. I mean, why would you call a link an edge? Shouldn't an edge be the edge of something? Later I learned that one of the first applications for our networks in mathematics was actually the study of geometrical objects, like cubes and stuff. And then it makes total sense, because on a geometrical object, what you represent by an edge is an actual edge, and what you represent by a vertex is an actual vertex. On the positive side, we now have a cool secret language that we can use to communicate with other power grid designers. For example, this reads, I'm talking about a power grid between Brno, Ostrava, Chilava and Selin. And I want to build power lines from Brno to Ostrava and from Ostrava to Selin. But wait a minute, is this actually one network or two? Because you know, Chilava is kind of isolated. Convention says, this is one network, but it has two components. One component is just Hilava, while the other component contains all the rest. So the components are the connected bits, while the network may be disconnected. Now we just need one more ingredient. We need some way to specify how expensive the individual power lines are. For me, this is hard to work out. So I will use the following trick. I will use the distance between cities as a proxy for the cost of the power line. So let's construct a table in which we record all the distances in kilometers. This is a nice table, but a table isn't actually a mathematical object. If you want to be more mathematical, we can use a matrix instead. 
But then a matrix doesn't come with space to store which city corresponds to which row and column. So we have to remember it separately. And we can actually write down the order of cities like this. This gives us a distance matrix D. We can now write DBO, or equivalently D12, to denote the distance from Ostrava to Brno. Note that this is in the opposite order that you would usually expect. Anyway, we find this distance in the first row and second column of the matrix. So in this case, it is 137 kilometers. We now have all the bits and pieces in place to phrase our question like this. How do we select a set of links such that all nodes end up in the same component while the combined length of the links is minimized? One way to solve this is a so-called brute force approach. We just consider all candidate networks that we can think of and then select the best one. But how many of these candidate networks are there actually? Could Ginger Saxel have considered them all in 1925, that is, without the help of modern computers? To compute the number of networks that can be constructed between a given set of cities, we can use a strategy that I call Simplify Generalized Check. We start by finding a very simple example that we can definitely solve. Then, in the second step, we generalize what we learned from this example to the general case. And finally, we check that we did the generalization right. Let's start simple with an example with only three cities. Between three cities, we can build up to three links. And for each of these links, we have the option to build it or to not build it. So one of the basic rules of combinatorics is that if you have independent choices, the number of options multiply. So if you have three links and two options for each of these, then the total number of networks we can end up with is two times two times two. So two to the three, which is eight. So these are the eight networks. Clearly, most of them are not good power grids, but we are not concerned with this at the moment. We just want to know how many options there are to check. So let's move on to the general case. For the general case, the first question is, how many links can we actually place between a given number of cities? Let's call this number of cities n. We can then think about this question like this. Every link needs a start point and an end point. So if you have n cities, that gives us n options for the start point. We probably don't want to link right back to the start, but this leaves us with n minus 1 options for the end point. Now we have n times n minus 1, because things again multiply. Well, we actually have a problem. This problem is that we've now counted every link exactly twice. See, we have counted Brno to Ostrava, but also Ostrava to Brno. But because we have counted every link exactly twice, we can easily fix this. The way to fix this is just to divide the result by 2. So the number of links that we can place between n cities is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Let's call this number of links k. For each of these k links, we have the option to build it or not to build it. So two options for each of the k links. Now things again multiply. And that means the total number of outcomes that we can get is 2 to the k. Now, if we put the k in, we find that the total number of different networks that we can construct between n labeled nodes is 2 to the n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Let's put some numbers in to see if this is correct. For example, we can now ask how many networks can we construct between zero nodes? The answer is 2 to the 0. So one, is this correct? Well, it actually is. There's exactly one network that doesn't contain any nodes. This is the so-called null graph. We can now also ask, how many networks can we construct between one node? The answer is again, two to the zero, so one. This is a network that contains one node and no links. This is actually the example of an empty graph, a graph that has nodes, but no links. It gets a little bit more interesting if you ask how many networks can be constructed 
between two nodes. In this case, the answer is 2 to the 1, so 2. And this makes sense, right? We can leave the two nodes separate, or we can link them into a pair. Finally, let's try three nodes. In this case, we get the answer 2 to the 3, so 8. These are exactly the eight networks that we saw before. So, this seems to work, doesn't it? So, how many candidate networks do we have to check? Well, if we put in the 5 from our example, we get the answer 2 to the 10. 2 to the 10? That is 1024. That's quite a lot. But even in 1925, Jindrich Chaksel could have sat down with pen and paper and worked through the 1024 networks. But remember, the real historical example had 50 smaller towns, not five cities. So with 50, we get 2 to the 1225. 2 to the 1225, that is this number. This is unbelievably many. If we used every hard drive and every piece of paper on the planet, we couldn't store that many networks. In fact, we wouldn't even scratch the surface. 2 to the 1,225? That's more than the number of atoms in the universe. This is so many. And networks are a little bit scary in this way, right? There are so many structures, even just between a handful of nodes. However, don't be scared. In this Networks and Complexity course, in just a few lectures, we will routinely be analyzing much larger networks. For our present example of finding the optimal power grid, there's fortunately an extremely nice and elegant solution that we will see in the second part of this lecture. With this method, we are going to be able to find the solutions to large networks just with pen and paper. Before we wrap up, there's another important message here. You have probably heard of Moore's law. The number of transistors on a computer chip doubles every 18 months. So the computational power on our hands increases exponentially. And people have been asking, why don't we solve everything just by computation? Well, I think this simple example of finding the optimal power grid gives us a glimpse of an answer here. Because the growth in the number of candidate solutions is much faster than exponential. Even if we add towns very slowly, this will eventually outpace the exponential growth of computational power. So while the computers get faster quickly, the complexity of our world ultimately increases faster. So that's the first part done. You can now watch another video like this one. Or maybe you can do some exercises and never forget what I told you. Actually, sounds like a good option, doesn't it? See you in the next one.